This is uh, Travis O'Gwen, CEO of Strange Music, and you're tuned in to Hot New Hip Hop. So from the very beginning, I mean, um, the way that I got into the music business was really, at first, uh, somewhat accidental. Um, the reality is I was in a furniture business where I had uh, multiple locations. I actually had 32 locations in 18 states and uh, was doing really, really well at a young age as an entrepreneur. So I ended up branching into, the first thing was into real estate, and then I branched off into uh, urban apparel. So back when things like FUBU and Anichi, all of those big urban companies that were doing you know, Carl Kanai, all that stuff, man. So all of that is, um, you know, so we got into a company called uh, Paradise Originals, which I actually financially backed and helped guide from a business standpoint. Uh, that's how I originally met Tech is because we had him come and do an actual fashion show for us. Plus, we started talking to him and started doing stage clothes, like custom stuff for him and things that he would wear on stage. And at that time, Tech just had a little buzz back in Kansas City, but it wasn't really uh, anything super significant. You know what I mean? But um, at the end of the day, man, after I met this guy and, and sat down and talked to him, I called a meeting with him because I'm like, this dude is phenomenal. Like, why isn't he everywhere? And once I called that meeting with him, I figured out why he wasn't. That's because he was involved in, in uh, multiple different deals. Uh, he had, I think there was at that time, six supposed managers. And I'm like, wait a minute, man, six managers and you're in Kansas City. Something's not going right. Uh, you heard the, the term too many uh, chefs in the kitchen or, uh, you know, that kind of thing. All chiefs, no Indians. So the, I, I looked at it and when I found out that there were six different managers and and honestly, I think there was about five different deals in place. There was a deal with the local hood label. Then there was a deal with um, with QD3, Quincy Jones's son, which then led to a deal with Quincy himself, which was then a part of Warner Brothers, which was and then the publishing deal over at Windswept. It, it was it was like really, really unnecessarily complicated. So at that time, I just wanted to meet him and, and, and possibly give him some business advice and, and really, um, you know, just hope that I can maybe give him some information. You know what I'm saying? But what I realized is he didn't need advice. Uh, he, needed, uh, he needed some money and he needed uh, a lot of really great lawyers and a new direction, you know? So uh, after the first meeting, I'm like, all right, man, well, you know, good luck. You know, I wish you the best. And uh, we kept supporting him from a clothing standpoint, but then, you know, he stayed in touch with me and then uh, he would have me, he would send me a song every once in a while over this course of like six months. Uh, then he would have me come down to a studio that he was recording in. And, uh, and, and I went down there one day, man, and he played me this song called uh, This Ring, which was originally off of Angelic. And uh, dude, I, I couldn't leave it alone. I, I must have played that song, man, literally a thousand times. So I'm like, all right, man, I got to help this dude out. So that was the beginning. I called another meeting and I said, man, forget about what your six managers and your multiple deals. Let's act like none of that exists. What do you want to do? And that's when he told me that his company was called EGN Arts on his publishing side. And I said, EGN Arts, okay? And he goes, yeah, man, that's strange backwards. He goes, I said, he, he said that I reserved, I did my publishing company as EGN Arts because if I ever truly have my own label, I want to call it Strange Music. And I'm like, well, I said fitting because at the time, you know, he was a little bit weird. You know what I mean? Strange was definitely one of, but it was deeper than that, man. He, he also told me about his love for the doors. He told me about, you know, all of the Jim Morrison, the people are strange, strange days, all these types of things. And I, I listened to him, man, and I said, well, listen, um, you know, and, and what he said to me is, man, it'll take a lot. It'll take a lot to, 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 to do what I need to do. And I'm like, I, I got a lot, you know what I mean? I can pull this off, you know what I mean? And uh, so let me help you. So it, it took us literally uh, over a year and a half of cleaning up all the messes, getting them out of a lot of the situations before we could even consider going forward. And so this is 99, and then we officially started the company in 2000. And, uh, and then when we tried to go get a distribution deal, because the original goal was, hey, we're going to go sell 50 or 100,000 albums, and then we're going to go get our Master P or our cash money deal. 
that was the mentality back then, you know. But but right when we started it, all those deals went away. The music business started to really spiral downward at that point, and so all of that was out the window. So we had to, to, to rethink all of that, and plus we couldn't even get a distribution deal because he hadn't had any real sales history. So we had to do a, a deal with a, a company up here in New York. Uh, we did a, a 50-50 joint venture with a company called j -Corps and a guy named Jay Ferris and uh, he had I don't know if you remember but he had he brought in like eight ball and MJG he brought in a variety of different guys at that time and uh, he actually fucked every one of them so so uh, the Jay Ferris guy yeah J core so uh, if you're watching this Jay fuck you and uh, I mean that from the bottom of my heart and let's hope we don't run into each other you fucking asshole but anyway he robbed a whole bunch of people I don't know if that's PC for your show all right but uh, but anyway um, you know he, we ended up having to come up here to New York and I'm one of the only guys in that arrangement that actually got our fucking album back you understand what I'm saying so he had to sign off on the dotted line and, and get us our album back and we got some of our money but uh, he still owes me a little north of 400 you know what I mean so uh, 400,000 so so I'd like to I'd like to catch up with him but then uh, after you know we did that deal uh, there was a guy that brought me in there named Dave Weiner so Dave Weiner his history is man he used to be a priority records and he was the guy who signed Master P to to the whole the, the whole uh, no limit deal through priority and uh, you know he he did that for a really long time well then when priority folded into capital you know EMI bought him then at that point he went and, and did this you know he went and uh, went to work for J Corps along with several other people from the priority days and priority company and um, and then once he seen that we were being done wrong he ended up quitting and leaving in protest and uh, and then uh, like I said we got the album back and then Dave called me once he found all that out and he said hey man I'm going back to get with my mentor uh, Mark Cerami uh, which Mark Cerami is one half of the priority records so Mark Cerami and Brian Turner owned priority so he's like you want to come over here man and, and talk to us I'm gonna get back with him man and and I think that you know tech would be the perfect uh, for first artist on this new thing called MSC <clears throat> so I'm like all right well let me take a look I don't like what just happened but if you're telling me this is a better situation I always I always like Dave you know what I mean and I went over there and we ended up striking a deal. We put out our first record in J Corps. We put out our first record in 2001 with Mark Cerami. You know, all that stuff expired, went, went and, and ran its course in a very short period of time. We were able to get away from there. We did a deal with Mark Cerami and MSC, and we put out uh, Absolute Power in uh, in 2002. Well, then, you know, everything was going really good at first, but then um, Mark Cerami had left the business about five years prior to that, and, uh, um, you know, when he tried to get back into the business, man, it was an entirely different business. So, you know, he would he would do things like throw lots of money at, at stuff, and I was always uncomfortable because I'm like, dude, I know that I got to recoup all of this yeah. before I get a cut, so... You know, uh, there, there were different things that he was doing. And like I said, at first there was a ton of support, but then he would, he would, uh, he was never really there or around. Uh, you know, he was on a, on a yacht somewhere in, in Micronesia. I don't know where the fuck Micronesia is, but at the end of the day, that's not really participating in our joint venture. And he would get frustrated that things didn't work the way that they used to work. So he became increasingly disconnected and eventually that deal ran its course from 2002 to 2005 and we had to get out of it you know what I mean I mean dude I, we moved to Los Angeles in 2004 we uh, we ended up having offices in the CNN building and the pri the old priority offices we had the whole top floor uh, we're spending more money than we needed to because the only real act there was Tech 9 and then we signed you know I had a couple of other acts that I put out through there nothing super significant but uh, when that deal ran its course and we finally got out of that uh, Tech and I were like regrouping and okay well this sucks because you know these first two deals didn't go as planned economically I'm about two million dollars into this deal personally and I'm like uh, you know and then your wife is looking at you kind of like hold up man whoa, whoa, whoa. you know she's always supportive but she did give me a couple of them uncomfortable looks along the way but she knew that I couldn't stop I couldn't fail so then as we looked up we said damn over the course of those two albums 
we sold not 50,000 or not 100, but we sold a half a million records. So we're like, okay, well, surely we can get distribution at this point. And that's when uh, Violet Brown introduced us to, uh, to Fontana and Steve Pritchett, rest in peace. Uh, but, uh, but, but Steve and a lot of the guys over there at Fontana tuned in. And then they came to one show at the Key Club in L.A., and the very next morning, uh, we had a deal memo. So, needless to say, they they seen something in tech, they seen something in us, the way that we ran our company, and um, they were impressed enough to give us a distribution deal. So, everything that you see that is strange music is really... 2006 with EverReady and forward. So the last uh, 11 and a half, almost 12 years, that's where, um, you know, fast forward, here we are millions of albums later, uh, you know, building the blueprint for what is hip hop touring, especially independent and merchandising. I mean, we're the guys that, that, that were the innovators who did the, the groundwork for everybody that you see out there touring right now. I, I promise you that, especially on an independent level. You know what I mean? I think, man, what I've seen and what I've seen in this dude's eyes, man, is, is just a real desire to find a way to, to make it happen. And, and you know, whenever I sit down and, and I talk to Tech, man, uh, he is an artist uh, top to bottom, man. And, and he's one of these guys that uh, has an overwhelming drive to just find a way to succeed. And, and that's the, the common... Uh, the commonality between the two of us is I've always been that way as well, but I've done it in business. I'm one of the, the, the rare exceptions in this shit is I never wanted to be a rapper. I never wanted to be an artist. Um, the reason that I love hip hop is because I went to a predominantly black high school, well, uh, the school system period, uh, elementary, uh, um, junior high and high school. My high school was about 85% black. So it's the music that I grew up on. It's the music, the, 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 that's the music that spoke to me those are the stories so I mean it's a combination of things but the main thing is this idea that that no matter what I'm going to find a way to succeed and I felt that energy in him and when talking to him and and setting with him I knew that that's uh, that that's that's a great combination because if you got two people that aren't going to find we're simply not going to fail if you got two people on that same accord man that's that's just that's that's great man that's a really really good push you know what I mean I started to study it, man. The first thing I did is I went out and I bought a bunch of books, and, and I read them, and there was some good information in them. I read every Donald Passman book that there was. I've read, yeah, I mean, I, I've read all of those. But what I realized is a lot of that stuff wasn't applicable to what it, what it was I was doing. So I then started studying other models that I thought were, you know, very unique. So, and you're going to laugh, but the, one of the models that I studied was uh, Hank Williams, Jr., uh, because at, in, in reality, he was a little bit of that outside of the box as far as a country artist goes. And, and a lot of people in the country music industry wouldn't give him the time of day because they felt like it was complete nepotism because of who his father was. So he had to go out there and he had to beat the path, man. This dude went out and played every, every shitty country bar in America while, while dragging along the swag, dra dragging along the t-shirts and the CDs and the hats and everything else and developed an incredible business and so you know this dude knocked on the door for years and years and years and then finally man he just kicked it in dude and then he ended up winning country artist of the year like three years in a row and and I studied that from the inside man because I had an opportunity to meet him and then I used to go down to his house in Paris Tennessee down at uh, down in uh, <laughs> for, for the annual event he uh, had this thing on the 4th of July called the butt naked barbecue so, um, yeah, man, that dude is a trip. So I, I studied that. I also, another model that I studied uh, that because it was a, a left of center was Kid Rock. That was a really unique story where he came up here to New York and he's, you know, living in an apartment uh, underneath uh, 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 Queen Latifah and, and all the things that he was doing and listening to his earlier stuff because Kid Rock wanted to be a hip hop artist, you know. Back in the day, that man was bars. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, it's, it's, it's super unique story. Who can go from, from rap, you know, wanting to do rap and doing hip hop stuff to going over to doing a rap rock, then predominantly rock and now leaning into country? Like if that's not diversity, dude, I have no idea what is. So I studied that model. I also studied, uh, um, you know, No Limit is obviously a huge, huge influence for me. And I got to study that from the inside because 
a lot of the people that work there who did the Dave Weiner who did that deal uh, now works for me still today. I mean, we've been we've been, you know, after the ceramic thing went left, he got away. He moved to Hawaii. He bounced uh, and then said, man, you know, because he, he's seen ceramics deal not going well and he just fed up with the business. He left, moved to Hawaii and was out there for several years. And then um, and then eventually once he came back, uh, he's been working with us ever since. You know, he, he's worked for us for a lot of years, bro. So I've known, you know, so I got to study Master P and really understand. And since then, you know, I've spent a lot of time with dude trying to understand what it was. What was you thinking? How did it work? Why did it work that way? I also studied the cash money deal. You know what I mean? Uh, I also looked at other uh, other labels like Suburban Noise. I looked at uh, Psychopathic Records, not from a music standpoint, really on either part of those, but just like this amazing merch deal that they did was, uh, and, and the fanaticism and the fan base that surrounded those guys was unbelievably intriguing. So Hank Williams Jr., Kid Rock, uh, you know, I, dude, the, the list goes on. But I studied everything that was a little bit left of center, man, like shit that was like a little bit outrageous. Like how did this happen knowing their start, their beginning, you know? So that, that's, uh, those are some of my influences and what I studied. Oh, man, it's a super, uh, back then it was a really weird sell. I don't know if it was hard, but it was sure it is fucking weird. I mean, this guy, here's a, here's a black dude with red spiked hair and imagery on Angelic, uh, everybody uh, thought that he was a devil worshiper. And if you know this, man, the black community does not toy with religion. So if, and then, yeah, man, and we're in the Bible Belt for real, right. but if you take and, and you have an album where he's falling from a wall and there's bloody angel wings nailed to the wall, um, that could that could definitely, I mean, I know why they labeled him a devil worshiper, but he was he was just really trying to explain uh, his battle between, you know, good and evil and, 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 and being stuck in the middle in purgatory. I mean, there was really, that was a, a, con a concept album through and through, man. And, and this is all the way back in 2001. So, um, but, but when you, when you try to market something uh, that is definitely uh, outside of the box, you have to take a whole new fresh approach. And that's what we did, man. We actually went out there and we did a lot of, of, of POP and a lot of posters, flats, flyers, and we would just plaster cities all over America then we would do it's all about impressions right so if I have that and somebody's driving down the street and they see a street snipe then they're in their local barbershop and they see a flyer for the same thing then they open up their their their, their double XL magazine or source magazine and they see something again by the time I get to that third impression I'm going to get them that they, they got it they the people are inquisitive they want to know okay what am I missing yeah, so, so then you mean you just keep making those impressions. And we were the first people in the Midwest to ever do vinyl rap vehicles, man. I did the first one in 2000. So back now, raps are everywhere. But, yeah. but, but needless to say, we were some of the first people to do it. And we did it at a time in which nobody else had it. So that was impactful. I started rapping vans and box trucks and, and just really taking it to the fans. You know what I mean? Because in those early days, we, we, we couldn't have success at radio. We, we fucked off a lot of money about 1.6 million on radio at one point during the Cerami time and on a total of four different singles. And, uh, and, and it was just robbery, man. We never really got anything for it. And that's because, again, his music didn't fit in that pocket. Plus, you know 90% of the people in this business are fucked up. They're, they're full of shit. You know what I mean? So that's the one thing learning early is like, okay, let me do, how do they do it? Oh, okay, that's how the majors do it? What's the opposite of that? And then let's start exploring the opposite of what every fucking major is doing because obviously this isn't working. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh, we developed a lot of our own processes, man. But touring, touring is, is the biggest one. And the first tour, we lost a lot of money, man. I lost over six figures on the first tour. I remember the Blue Agave in San Diego, California, uh, seven people bought tickets. And we're, we went in there and did that show like it was, you know, 70,000, you know, and there was more people working there than fans that showed up. And, and now I don't think we've uh, missed a sellout in San Diego for the last 12 years, you dig? So obviously you got to go plant seeds. You might, that's going to cost you money. You come back, you water it, and, and it may cost you money, or you might accidentally fuck around and be cool and break even. 
And then when you come back a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, eventually those crowds build and now you have a very viable real business. Touring has been, uh, touring and merchandising is part of the, the real success story behind Strange Music, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, there's, there's twofold. Let's go back to piracy. And, and in regards to piracy, we never really felt like uh, that affected us. As a matter of fact, man, we did a whole, uh, whole campaign called FTI, which stood for Fuck the Industry. So once we went out there with our first single and we tried to get traction, spent a bunch of money, and we didn't get anywhere, the money that I designated for the second single, instead of going out and shooting a big video again and, and going and spending you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of radio, I went ahead and bought ads on all the major channels and I did a very short PSA, <clears throat> which was tech, saying uh, you know, that we didn't believe that music, uh, I mean, that piracy was the downfall of, of all the business, that we believe that good music still sold. And just to prove it, we're going to put our new album up for free and come and download it. And if you like what you hear, please support us by picking up a copy. And, you know, everybody, there was a lot of people that were really fucking angry with me when I decided to do this. And, and, uh, and matter of fact, Violet Brown, who was the biggest buyer of urban music at the time, uh, called up and cussed all my people out. And then she called me up and cussed me out. And I'm like, but Violet, I, I believe that this is, this is, I believe good music sells. I really do. And, uh, you know, I said, what's happened for so long is these majors have been putting out albums with their one single embedded somewhere in the front five of that album. And then you go out there like kids like me, dude, I go out and I shoveled snow and I mowed yards so I could get money. Money for what? So I could go to the record store and buy all the new cassettes or the new CDs. And, and when I did that and I realized the only fucking good song on there is the one that I heard on the radio. Uh, man, what a disappointment. So, you know, the major labels have been fucking people for a long time by putting out a lot of subpar content and with a, a full album with one or two good songs. Uh, no wonder people got fed up. No wonder there was a, a process of going out there and starting to pirate and see what the hell they liked before they made that purchase. And on top of that, the majors fucked the whole deal up anyway because they knew about MP3 technology well before its release. So they didn't do anything about it because they were all high out of their minds flying around on private jets looking for new yachts to buy uh, because they you know when you go from a cassette to a cd you give the cd to them that's the master you know a cd is what all tapes used to be made off of now you're going to give them the digital master which could easily be converted into mp3 and you're not thinking about the repercussions what what's going to be five years from now so it's their own fucking fault it's a combination of things you gave away the master and secondly you knew about mp3 technology but you didn't do anything to set up parameters and on top of that you've been screwing these kids for so long, giving them shit music, uh, hey man, you made your own bed, now lay in it. But, but after Violet Brown cussed me out, you know, I'm like, damn, Violet, you know, I thought she was a friend of mine, but she was livid. Uh, we ran all of those ads and um, the result was a 400% increase in our sales. So then I called Violet back. I said, so uh, how are things? They're good. I'm like, yeah. I said, I, I, I love the fact that you're continuing to buy the album. It's looking really good. She goes, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, uh, and then, you know, a little bit of stuttering and hesitation, and she goes, okay, you motherfucker, you were right, all right, you know, okay, you, you're fucking right, you're right, you're fucking right, you know, and, and, and Violet, you know, I love that lady to death, I mean, she was like my entrance into the business, to be honest with you, but that... It's not just the piracy that killed the business, it was the business itself. I mean, you, you dumbasses gave the, the master away, you knew about MP3 technology, and you've been giving kids shit music with the exception of one or two songs. So they made their own bed, they had to lay in it, and, and it's been an uncomfortable lay, you know? Fast forward, uh, our music revenue, see we used to have three different forms of revenue that were near parallel. Music was one of them, touring was another, and then merchandise, and all of them were within 7% annually. So that's, that's huge, you know, we're, we're, we're like, I mean, we built this to where these things are within 7% annually. Now, in the last five, well, um, exactly the last four years, what we ran the most recent study on internally, we've lost 68% of our music revenue, 68 in just the last four years. So people are like, what, what, what? I thought the music business was getting better, da, 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 da. 
in a raw numbers thing, when you're talking about catalog, yeah, the music business has improved because of these massive, massive catalogs of music that have existed for so many years is all out there in the system for consumption. So there's a lot of pros to stream. The whole business is going streaming. We all know that, right? Physical CDs, Best Buy, they cut the fucking CDs out of their stores. Uh, Target said that we all, all of us labels need to go on consignment basis. So they're out of the fucking business too, if, if that be the case, because n- I'm not going to do that i'm not going to give you consent man you just took me back 20 years like i'm not doing that so you know obviously streaming is it and and for me man the way i've been explaining it is um there's a really really bright light at the end of the tunnel man there really is i just don't know how long this fucking tunnel is and i'm a little bit claustrophobic you dig so so i know that there's a bright light at the end of the tunnel i know that streaming only currently covers 22 percent of the world's population I'm well aware that if we can get this to the masses, like India was supposed to come on in December, now it's an any day thing. If India comes on, man, that's 1.3 billion fucking people. There's only 326 million people here in the United States. That's 1.3, they beat us by like nearly a billion people. If you fuck around and get China on board, that's 1.6 billion, but I can only be excited about China right now for my pop division because they banned hip hop in China. Yeah, so so we got to deal with that shit, you know. And, but eventually that'll fade out too. I just don't know if I'll be around. You know what I mean? But, but you know, um, what what people were worried about was the physical sales going away. That's not what killed us. What killed us is iTunes got decimated. So I went from having you know seven eight hundred thousand dollar months with iTunes to having fifty and sixty thousand dollar months. So what people you know because if you're already digital, you're already savvy, you're already in that space. You're no longer going to go to iTunes and download an album for fucking twelve ninety nine. You're going to go, uh, you're going to get free music, which is fucked up. But also on top of that, you're you're going to nine ninety nine. You get every single release every single week. Why wouldn't you do that? You know what I mean? Same. So that's decim- it decimated iTunes, and then you know physical continued to dwindle. Everybody thought it was going to be you know physical's been doing this iTunes did this, you understand? And that's just because you're in that digital space. Those kids are going to be there. So um, am I optimistic? Uh, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be in New York right now. Uh, I wouldn't be sitting with you guys. If I wasn't like super optimistic about the future of the business. As a matter of fact, as soon as I leave here, I go over to Spotify to talk to those guys and work with them on several different things that we're work- working on on upcoming releases. But if you're not within those playlists, you know, the playlist are the radio stations of streaming. And, and you know, you, people used to bitch about, oh, there's not enough urban stations and to, to play hip hop. And then Rhythmic started playing some hip hop. Well, and, and, and in that space, you really got one motherfucking radio station. It's called Rap Caviar. Mm-hmm. You have 50 slots on Rap Caviar. Only the top 20, the first 20, really make a difference. So at the end of the day, uh, if you're not on, you know, one of 20 records in the entire country, you're not really moving the needle as much. Now, will that develop and grow? Yeah, man, they, they've got, you know, what's next. They've got, they've got uh, the workout mix, most necessary. They've got all those things that are, that are coming up. But right now, there's one big station, and then there's some, like, college, high school level stations, you know what I mean, and in comparison. So um, that has to continue, that model has to continue to develop and grow, but, but it's hard to make a ton of money when you're getting paid point zero zero three two cents per stream. However, uh, if you have the world's population on it, great. Then you get rid of all the manufacturing costs, all the returns. You also are able to, I can, I can get on my laptop that's in that bag over there and upload music and have it live in three days or actually quicker for us. You know what I'm saying? So there's definitely some pros, man. But um, right now we're in a transitional period uh, that, that not everybody's going to survive. You understand what I'm saying? Not everybody's going to be able to withstand this. We will because of how diverse uh, we are and, and how we get other ancillary incomes from music, you know? Our following is so strong. And, man, without them, we wouldn't be shit. Without the fans, that, that's what people forgot about, too. Major labels, they forgot about the fans, man. We fucking care. We care a lot, dude. We do a lot of extra shit for our fans that, that we know that they're the most important part of this whole fucking equation. After the music gets done, dude, without them, nothing, nothing. 
we're nothing. We were we were definitely independent uh, and, and way before it was sexy, way, way, way before it was cool. And, um, you know, I, I think what happened is when we got into it, it wasn't the thing. Everybody wanted to be on a fucking major. Everybody wanted some kind of a big deal. And independent was not really the thing. Uh, and we developed it out of necessity at first. It wasn't just some mindset, but we wanted to control our own destiny. You know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, um, as we started to build it, then as we had success with it, it became very fucking cool. And, you know, when I started signing at different acts and, you know, I signed J-Rock, uh, you know, we, yeah, we had J-Rock come over and then I did a first writer refusal on Kendrick Lamar, Schoolboy Q, uh, Absol and Black Hippie. Like we had the option to do all of those records as well. Uh, and working, you know, I had Top and Punch and all these guys coming out to Kansas City. I sat down with Top many, many times. And, and, and by the way, dude, he's done a fucking phenomenal job of navigating this shitty business. I'm, I'm very impressed by Top, and I applaud everything that Top, Punch, Dave Free, uh, Ali, all those guys are family. You know what I mean? They're really good dudes. And, and um, you know, the way that they navigated it, they decided to uh, take and get in, in, in the major system to, to properly utilize their power and money to build their brand. But, you know, with the thing with um, when, when Kendrick used to come out with us, it was J-Rock on tour. Kendrick was J-Rock's hype guy. So the first couple of tours we did, that was, that was J-Rock's, uh, I mean, that was Kendrick's role was hype dude for him. And then uh, I, I know that J-Rock always allowed Kendrick to do like one or two uh, songs during the, during the performance. And, uh, and then I, I remember the time in Los Angeles and I knew that Dre was uh, uh, going to apparently sneak into the venue. That night I think he did three songs. And I think that's where the whole shit sparked off. But, you know, I, I remember times when uh, when Top would, would hit me and be like, hey, Trav. I'm like, yeah, what's up, man? He's like, hey, man, if a motherfucker said this to you, what would you say back? And I'd be, he, I'm like, where are you at? He goes, I'm in the hallway up here in New York. Da, 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 da. I'm like, all right, man, so look, do this. Say this, say this. And, bro, use us as the fucking example. You know what I'm saying? Because we bucked the system the entire time we've been in this business. Use us as the example. He's like, ah, yeah, that's good. All right, bro. Boom. He go in there. And, 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 and uh, so I, I would like to say that we played a part in the very beginning of all of that success. And, uh, and, and I'm proud to have done that because I think Kendrick is solid through and through, man. Love that fucking guy to death. Every time I see him, man, all love. I just watched him win. Well, it was four or five more Grammys uh, when I was up here in New York a few weeks ago. You know what I mean? So, um, but 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 even then, you know, even when the deal was in, in, in already done with Interscope, you know, because as a way to do that, right? Top was very masterful at that. He was like, Nah, man, dude said he got that. You know, so they would offer him a deal. Nah, man, fuck, man, the guy that's got the first rider, man, he, he got that. I'd be like, Yeah, yeah, okay. What's the number? Boom. Yep. Fuck that. You know, I got that. I got, no, nah, fuck, you can't get him for that. No, nope, I'm doing it. And we kept driving it up, driving it up, driving it up. And eventually it met a point where he was happy and he did the deal. And then ultimately came to me for the write-off on um, Schoolboy Q was next. Then he needed it for Absol. And then he needed it to, then he wanted J-Rock back. And so I'm like, that's cool, man. I really wanted to do the next J-Rock record, but... Uh, you know, tell me your plan. And he told me and then uh, I was like, well, look, man, I still I'm still, you know, X amount down on J-Rock. And uh, he was cool enough to, to cut the check. You know what I'm saying? He's like, oh, OK, cool, man. And he broke me bread on my my my, you know, my negative on J-Rock and ended up bringing J-Rock back in. And I've been quietly rooting for J-Rock to kick ass because he used to be the lead of everything TDE. And, and, and then I heard him come out rapping his ass off recently. I'm like, all right, here we go. All right. You know, and I think I'll be seeing those guys tomorrow night, man. We're doing a big event in Los Angeles tomorrow night. And I think most of them are coming through. And I think uh, 40's coming through, Snoop's coming through. It'll be a nice little event. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, man, so when that deal happened, though, you, you guys didn't know about Interscope. Y'all didn't know about Interscope. It was all TDE. It was all Top Dog Entertainment for nearly the first year uh, before anybody knew that Interscope was in the back, you know, pulling. Yeah, the, yeah. So now everybody's doing it, man. You know, I watched, you know, Macklemore's camp do it with what they did. I watched, you know, a lot of different people have the background that have the have the major in the background, and the major realized that man, kids don't fuck with us no more. You know why? 
going back to putting out shitty albums, putting out one or two songs on a, on a 12 song album, you guys have fucked kids over for so long that they want to go the indie route. And not, not only that, but as, as, as a young person listening to music, you want to be the person that discovers it. You understand what I'm saying? You want to be able to turn your friends on to shit. I remember getting my first Easy e tape, and I used to drive around to my friend's house like, hey, man, check this out. I pop it in. Oh, man, let me copy that. Nope. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you can't get this, man. You gotta, uh, I'll get it to you another time. I drive the next friends. Man, listen to this shit. You know what I mean? So that music discovery was always something really fucking cool, and that's what you're able to get with doing, you know, with these kids are pursuing independent music because they're looking for something different. They're not looking for something cookie cutter where the majors get their A&R involved and they use this fucking producer, this writer, this guy on the hook, this is the song. Fuck that, man. Don't nobody want that shit. You know, we want some kind of, like, variety. You know what I mean? And, and I think people have expanded. Not only that, man, but you remember kids used to be like, I only like country music or I only listen to hip-hop. I only listen to rock. I listen to every motherfucking thing. I listen to all of it. And I think that, that you know, and, and I'm 46 years old, so I know kids today, a lot of them like a variety of different music, man. There's a blend of genre going on with these kids today like never before. And, and majors, they don't know how to figure that shit out. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's the biggest, it's, you know, people said hip-hop was going to be temporary. Back when I listened to it, back in the MC Shan, LL Cool J, you know, uh, Africa Van but I mean, Everybody said hip hop wasn't here to stay, uh, and now it's the biggest music period. It's the biggest music genre period. So, uh, evidently, uh, people were wrong. You know what I mean? So, um, hip hop is a very important here to stay. Uh, you know, uh, going to be involved in uh, what they call the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, you know what I mean? Like the motherfucking rappers are all throughout there now, and that's because it has an impact on people's lives. You know what I mean? If you may, if you have music that impacts people's lives. And, and they experience life uh, while, while experiencing that music, man. That's what's important. Hip-hop's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It continues to blend and morph into some other shit. You remember when white rappers weren't accepted at all unless you were Eminem? And now Eminem's the only guy that had a pass as far as a white rapper for a really long time. Now there's a, the white rappers everywhere, man. Yeah. Fucking G-Eazy and, I mean, dude, the, the, the list goes on of white rappers that are killing it right now. Post Malone, I don't know if you can call him a rapper, but he's up in the fucking mix, you know? So it's, 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 it's an interesting time, man. It's really cool. I mean, strange, man. Again, as I said just a little bit earlier, man, I love all music, right? I mean, I, there's a couple that I don't love that much, but, but I, I really like a variety of music. I listen to pop music. I listen to hip hop. Hip hop is my base, obviously. But I listen to pop music. I listen to classical music. I listen to opera because of my daughter. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of all types, but we made a, a conscious effort uh, just over seven years ago and said, you know, you know how a lot of hip hop producers really want to do pop records? Mm -hmm. Well, our main producer, Seven, is no different. Uh, Michael Seven Summers wanted to get into that genre as well, so we started going out and exploring and trying to find what we could do to develop uh, a pop act on our label, you know what I mean? Or a subsidiary of our label, because we knew that a lot of our fans would shit on that idea. Oh, you sell out? Yeah, I'm trying to sell out of every motherfucking store I can. I'm trying to sell out shows. So, so um, anyway, we, um, we, we signed our first act to them, nearly, to a Strange Maine, nearly uh, three and a half years ago. But, uh, you know, the first few years we were seeking people and we're like, oh, this kid's really dope. And we went to see him and we were like blown away by him. And then we looked and we noticed that he wasn't, you know, he didn't look so good that day. And then we found out, oh, that's because he hadn't had his dialysis that day. And we're like, oh, fuck, the dude wouldn't be able to really travel. You know what I mean? Because we know the fundamentals of music business. It's really surrounding touring and merchandising. So that really wouldn't make sense, you know. And then... Uh, uh, we were we were just doing a, a, a variety of different researches and couldn't find anything. So once we found this band Above Waves out of Chicago, we signed them. And matter of fact, their project comes out this year as well. I had a date, but but I'm having to shift that date around a little bit. But uh, and then right underneath our nose was what ended up being our marquee, you know, first pop artist. And um, and this is the part that sucks. Um, it's my 18 year old daughter. Yeah, so Mackenzie Nicole, if you see a lot of stuff coming out on her, that's my 18-year-old daughter. So I, 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 I did not want her in the fucking music business. I had no desire for her to be an artist, but she's been singing since she was six years old. 
Uh, she's trained classically in opera, uh, and she sings in four different languages, and she featured on her first Tech Nine record. Uh, it, was, it was Tech Nine, Three Six Mafia, and her on a song called Demons when she was nine years old. Since then, I think they've done 10 different collaborations. She's also collaborated with everybody on the damn label at this point. And, uh, you know, she was supposed to be on this Collabos record that we did, right? And on the Collabos record, Tech never got the record done uh, to, to have her featured on. And then he left town. She was kind of bummed out because she was looking forward to it because she loves it. And I said, no, nah, don't trip here. You and Seven get together. You do your own song, and we'll send it out to Tech on the road and just get a, a, a verse from him and put that on there. And she goes, really? I'm like, yeah, sure, let's go. You know, And I, I just did it because I, I knew how much it meant to her. And we did it, and then we put this song, this, this uh, Acting Like You Know is the name of it. We put it on this all-hip-hop album, you know, a collaboration of all of our artists. And uh, do you know it's the, the largest selling song off of the entire album? It was the most popular not only with the masses as far as sales, but the, the surveys that we do with our bass. It was the most popular song on the entire album. And I'm like, oh, shit, that means I got to do a video. Like, I didn't want to do it. I didn't do shit. I, like, I made it harder for her because I didn't really want her to do it. But then when it stood up, I'm like, well, I'll be a complete asshole if I don't go ahead and do this. We did the video, and it's already at millions of plays. I'm like... This is really working. And then we ended up doing another song called Deleted, and it works. So uh, her album comes out April 13th. It's called The Edge. It's our first, uh, it's our first full-fledged venture into uh, the pop music side. And we just announced Strange Main uh, today, ironically. Uh, you know, it uh, came out in, in Billboard with a huge thing we did with them. And, um, and yeah, here we go, man. Her album, her record's being added all over the country right now. I just got an update when I was walking up here. And uh, it blows me away. And, and she, I left to go out in the hallway. Uh, I had to call her because she's getting on a plane to meet me in L.A. Uh, to do this event and to do a ton of press for herself. So, yeah, man, we're getting into the mainstream business. It's not an abandonment of hip-hop. It's not that we're changing it. Strange music is strange music. The fundamentals are there. They're always going to be there. And we're going to continue to expand and grow. But why wouldn't we do another genre that Tech and I want to be involved in and, and um, you know, the idea that it starts off with, uh, with McKenzie is uh, a trip, but what the fuck did I expect, you know what I mean? I'm expecting her, dude, I've been up here so much, you know, she got accepted to, to multiple Ivy League schools, like this little girl's a brainiac, uh, she's, a, she's, she's something special, man, and, and I'm like, okay, cool, you know, I've been up to Princeton like three times, okay, that's what I know she's going to be doing the next four or five years, and as a parent, that's a certain amount of comfort in that, you know, but now there's a gap year and maybe even more, so we'll see what happens.